Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, a novel low-cost pyroelectric device for enhancing solar cell efficiency, brought to you by Solar Power World Magazine and Ultrasolar Technologies. We would like to thank Santosh Kumar, CEO and CTO of Ultrasolar Technology, for giving us his time and insights into their interesting technology. I'm Frank Andorka, Editorial Director of Solar Power World, and I'll be your moderator today. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Uh, if you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag SolarWebinar. We love social media and we hope you do too. You can follow us at, sol at SolarPowerWorld or me at SolarFrankA. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Go ahead and submit your questions and we will ask them after all the presenters are finished. Questions can be asked using the GoToWebinar on your screen. Presenters will be available to answer questions after the presentation. Before he starts his presentation, I'd like to introduce Santosh Kumar, a self-described serial entrepreneur with strong solar technology and physics background. Kumar spent 20 successful years in the semiconductor and the hard drive industry, covering all elements of photovoltaic photovoltaic technology and operations. His inventions and technology are the basis of three companies, more than a dozen products, and more than two dozen technologies. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Santosh. Thanks, Frank. Um, do I have a control? Yeah. yeah. Santosh, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. here. Actually, I'm trying to. Okay. No, 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 no I'm fine. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Frank, uh, for uh, uh, introducing me. And um, let me start the webinar by uh, welcoming every, everyone on the uh, everyone listening to the webinar. Uh, I wanted to let you know uh, uh, in the beginning what the purpose of this webinar is. The purpose of this webinar is to introduce to the audience a completely disruptive method to dramatically increase the PV power uh, and the product, which is called Quantum Boost. And um, the company that has created the quantum boost, and uh, and the technology. Uh, we will also go through the benefits and Q&A at the end of it. Santosh, if you Santosh, if you go ahead and click on the slide. Um, that will start the presentation, and then from then on, you can use whatever. All right, thank you. Sorry, but okay. Um, <laughs> we we start we are on now. So um, let me start with the mission statement. At this moment, we are the only company that. It has a true efficiency enhancing technology. We do it at a fraction of cost, and pyroelectricity is our enabling science and technology. Our mission is to be the leader in low cost PV power enhancement using our technology. Let's go to the next slide. This slide is talking about uh, how the inventions occur. Um, all technology has to be discovered, adapted, evolved, and accepted to continue to uh, advance forward. The cycle speed is determined by the discovery of new technology, their adoption rate, and penetration or acceptance, and support in the marketplace. This slide describes at a high level a model to predict the next stage in the life cycle of an innovation and the speed at which it will go to the next stage. We've created a sim uh, simple uh, model um, using equations to predict the behavior 
and have applied to some um, to some market for uh, to, to verify our prediction. So the next slide is uh, giving you some examples. In the examples shown here, the key point is that the adoption and the next stage of the innovation is a function of the uh, number of scientific discoveries, the amount of financial support, and the existing adoption rate. For example, electric cars do not have new science to support the next stage. However, there is a good financial support. As a result, according to our model, although the existing adoption will, uh, will rise to approximately 1% or so, since the cars will not have any, uh, anything drastically different to offer in foreseeable future, the adoption will not exceed a small percentage. The next slide is talking about solar. Solar, or PV, on the other hand, has several new scientific discoveries available. For example, heart carrier, which has caused the solar, uh, solar spiral to go through the science quadrant the second time, and now it's in the, uh, it's in the disruption quadrant. The financial support has led the adoption rate to exceed uh, more than a, exceed, a, exceed a percent or so, and the adoption is going to increase to a much higher number, say 10%, in the future segment of the spiral. Next slide is uh, the, uh, talking about the cost efficiency of the PV technology. If you look at the solar cell technology um, historically, the solar cell technology is in its third stage of development. The first stage was when the technology was first productized and the first solar cell was made, and it was too expensive for adoption. It only uh, involved crystalline silicon or compound semiconductors. Then was the second stage. We are currently in the second stage. Um, and this stage is when the, when the market felt that there was a need for this technology. Billions of dollars were invested in this technology to make the product cheaper and affordable. Thin film solar cells were developed to, uh, to reduce the price of the solar cells. So this stage is primarily about cost reduction to, uh, to compete with the grid, um, grid electricity, electricity cost. The next stage, which, is, which I call stage three, uh, in this stage, as a result of activities in stage two, the adoption of solar worldwide, uh, solar worldwide uh, exceeds 1%. And in order to go further in cost reduction and efficiency in, in, uh, improvement, a disruption must be made. Hard carrier technology is one of the disruptive technologies, which is part of the stage three. Next slide. In the, in the next two slides, this slide and the next slide, we're going to compare uh, working on PV efficiency enhancement uh, in the upstream and downstream uh, areas of the you know, solar chain. So as shown in the previous slide, the solar adoption rate has increased from a really small number to close to 1% due to cost reduction. Solar needs to be substantially cheaper than the incumbent for a much higher adoption rate, say 10%. An evolutionary approach of, uh, of um, of a new product every 18 months is, is not going to meet the requirement for 10% adoption. Therefore, disruptive technologies such as hot carriers, uh, solar cells are being worked on. However, these technologies are at least five years away from the, uh, from the first use in a product. Additionally, it requires greater than $100 million in, uh, dollars investment to make any substantial changes to, the, uh, to incorporate a disruptive method to the upstream solar cell technology. Ultrasolar has enabled a technology which is based on a similar principle as hard carriers with much less investment and much less time by incorporating the technology in, a, uh, in the quantum boost box, which is part of the, down, of the downstream solar technology or balance of system. In the next slide, we are going to talk about uh, the uh, downstream about the quantum boost, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ultrasolar technology uses pyroelectricity to create and inject very high frequency pulses into the solar cells to improve their efficiency. The technology works across a broad, uh, broad spectrum of solar cell materials. Pyroelectricity is a mechanism by which some crystalline materials produce electricity from changing temperature. The requirement of changing temperature is met microscopically, uh, microscopically inside the thin film stack used in quantum boost. UST, which is ultrasolar technology, applies the pulse 
pulses generated by pyroelectricity or pyroelectric structure to capture the electrons generated by higher energy solar radiation. This will be clear in the next few slides. So as I mentioned, our, our approach is downstream. Capturing electrons generated by high, uh, high energy solar radiation uh, could dramatically change the efficiency of a solar cell. Theoretically, you could double the crystalline silicon efficiency. However, it requires making changes to the semiconductor, anywhere from modifying the band gap to using quantum wells. This makes the technology very difficult, resulting in requiring of uh, several hundred million dollars and years of development. This is the way upstream upstream developments are. All, all upstream developments have taken a lot of money and have taken a lot of time. UST applies the principles of upstream third generation technology uh, downstream or in the uh, VOS area, which has enabled UST to achieve high efficiency from the solar cells. The advantage is that we can work on the technology independently of the basic solar cell technology and thus improve on the innovation. Um, this also helps with the time, on, time, time to market. Time to market constraints are now improved to, a, uh, to an individual device and, and all the testing. Uh, I'm sorry, all the testing, certification, and approvals for a single component are much shorter in uh, innovation. Well, they, they take much shorter time. And the product can be, uh, and more innovations can be used with this product. The next slide, we are introducing the Quantum Boost product. As you can see, uh, there, uh, on the left-hand side, we are introducing the Quantum Boost box. And, the, and, the, on, and on the right-hand side, how it is used in the system. The current quantum boost device is tailored to light commercial and residential systems only. The technology is designed to fit between the panels and the inverter. It is designed to go within 100 feet of the, uh, of the string. And uh, the impact on the system to, uh, is to increase the DC current into the inverter. There is a, neg uh, a negligible chance to the uh, I'm sorry, there's a negligible change to the input voltage. So let's talk about the company that enabled it. Um, this slide is basically introducing myself, but uh, uh, we have a group of PhDs with, uh, with plenty of experience in uh, both photovoltaic and uh, other areas of physics. This uh, has, happens to be my third uh, uh, technology company, and uh, this team has over 100 years of experience in technology industries, and they have degrees in physics, material science, electrical engineering, and photovoltaics. So uh, um, it, it actually takes that much of uh, uh, scientific power to create something like this. Let's talk about this company a little bit. The company was founded in 2009. Uh, we have our headquarters in Santa Clara. Uh, though the company has been in existence since 2009, we shipped beta product in Q4 2012. A unique chemistry of venture capital, angel investment, and <coughs> tier one balance of system companies make up the uh, make up the auto solar ecosystem. Today, this unique collection of talent has. Uh, developed a technology where only five to six people in the whole world have ex expert knowledge of it, and UltraSolar has worked with all of them to bring this breakthrough to market. <coughs> Sorry, let's, let's talk about pyroelectricity a little bit. So the question on everyone's mind is why use pyroelectricity? The answer is simple. The unique characteristics of this technology allow us to create an electric field based upon a continuous temperature change that will generate pulses at, a, at very high amplitude and frequency. Because we're not using conventional electric circuits, the power consumption is very low. And uh, it's almost negligible. The device works in ambient temperature from minus 12 degrees C to plus 20 degrees C. And uh, as a result, 
uh, we can operate in, in a standard work environment. In the next slide, I'm actually showing to you um, the creation of uh, the uh, pulses using pyroelectricity. So the way we generate high frequency pulses from pyroelectric films is by creating standing thermal waves inside the film in a uh, design very similar to to etalons. Uh, if you're familiar, uh, if you're familiar with optics technology, they use a lot of etalons. Uh, this above, uh, I mean, this, this picture here is basically a simulation of high frequency pulses we can generate. Let's talk about hard carriers. So essentially, um, hard carriers are carriers or electrons in um, in a solar cell um, that have more energy than um, than than is required. So uh, what happens is, if you uh, if solar cell is, is exposed to a light uh, energy which is greater than its band length, uh, bandwidth um, or band gap, I'm sorry, <laughs> the electron that is generated in the process has very high energy and uh, quite often that energy is, uh, is very, very difficult to harvest. And if you were able to harvest that energy, a uh, lot of improvement in, uh, uh, in the efficiency of solar cells could be made. So uh, the, uh, we're using standard equations in this. Let's go to the next slide. So as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, the hot electrons are electrons with very high energy. So what happens to the electrons with very high energy? They move very, very fast. So the likelihood of these electrons to uh, to hit a lattice site and give up some or all of all of this energy is very very high. So uh, the uh, in order to to capture the uh, uh, the the heart capture the energy from um, from from this side of the uh, uh, spectrum of the solar um, solar solar radiation you you have to capture the electron and, uh, and its energy because uh, if it's not captured, you might lose the electron altogether or at least lose most of its energy. Okay. In this slide, as you can see, um, the uh, electron is hitting a, uh, a lattice and uh, converting the energy, the, the, the extra energy into phonon. So let me briefly talk about phonon in the uh, next slide. So a uh, greater discussion of phonon is outside the scope of uh, this webinar, but I want to briefly discuss about that. Uh, phonons are essentially uh, m vibration waves or mechanical waves uh, inside the crystal. Uh, phonons play an important role in harvesting the excess um, heart carriers in the lattice, mainly because phonons can be used to increase the lifetime of heart, care, heart excitons. Uh, the way it is used in, in many cases is you, you, in order to prevent an electron from uh, going and hitting a lattice site, you inject phonons and uh, that phonon interacts with electrons and prevents it from hitting a lattice site. So phonon becomes important. Phonon is also important because uh, the the uh, the transfer of electrons from a valence band to a conduction band in silicon includes phonons, as you will see in the next slide. The mm, this is a, uh, a picture, uh, a approximate drawing, or not even approximate. This is a cartoon bit, pretty much, of a uh, Silicon uh, band. The top of the band, the top, the, the the green line is the conduction band, and the red line is the valence band. Uh, as you can see, the bottom of the conduction band is not aligned with the with the with the top of the valence band. And in the uh, in the uh, band-to-band -band transition, the 
the momentum must be conserved. Therefore, a phonon has to uh, interact, or a phonon has to supply the, the additional energy to, to, conserve, the, uh, to conserve, the, conserve the momentum in this uh, um, in, in silicon band to band transition. Therefore, in silicon, uh, the uh, the energy, uh, the, the the additional electrons are not generated to the surface. The light has to go a little bit inside um, the surface in order to generate the electrons. <coughs> now, um, so far, I've introduced the uh, the pyroelectricity, and I've also introduced the uh, yeah, the uh, the hot carriers. In the next slide, I'm going to briefly introduce to you our model. Uh, what we do is we apply high frequency pulses generated generated by pyroelectric uh, pyroelectric structure that we have inside our quantum boost box to the uh, solar cell. And this is basically a, uh, you know, sort of cartoon of what the, what the, what the pulses look like inside the cell. So as you can see, as the pulses progress, the, <coughs> the uh, electrons may jump over the, uh, the, the potential barrier or turn through the potential barrier. The, the potential barrier change happens because of the electric field. Um, uh, because because of the electric field changing the shape of the the quantum barrier, and uh, after using uh, a simulation, we did some calculation, and from the calculation, as you can see, uh, the x-axis here is essentially uh, the the when the voltage is dropping to the field, but it's basically basically both the voltage and the pulses. Uh, as you can see. With about 150 volts or so, you can increase the current by 42 percent. So, the I'm going to the next slide. In this slide, I'm going to show to you the measurement system. As you can see, this is a, um, um, a quantum boost box and this is whole measurement setup. Uh, the uh, device with GR written on it, it is grid simulator, essentially an a it's an AC power supply, and uh, load is essentially light bulbs, and there's a microinverter here. So the way we uh, do the measurement is that we supply um, uh, power through the, as at, the, at the input of the QB quantum box, we have solar uh, panels connected, so power from the solar panel is going through the QB, and uh, then through the inverter, and uh, and to the to the load, and the load is also getting power from the grid simulator. So uh, the as you as you connect the uh, power from the solar cell or uh, solar panels to the QB, you will see that the power required to light up these bulbs reduces, and you can see the number uh, number going down in the grid simulator. Uh, so by you, uh, by connecting the solar power uh, solar panel directly to the QB, or I mean to, to the QB or directly to the inverter, uh, you can actually see the power increase by the QB or the quantum boost box. So here's the result from our measurement. Uh, you can see that the in uh, the uh, inclusion of the QB in the or quantum boost in the circuit or the solar panel connected to the quantum box and quantum boost box connected to the inverter, it gives you an additional power of 27.6 percent. So, uh, so in the lab, so in the lab, we can see uh, up to 27.6 hectares and sometimes even higher uh, power increase. So uh, I wanted to mention to you that we also see that this was a lab test, but we also see this thing in real system. In um, in our company, we have uh, 
18 kilowatts of solar, strength, solar power available. Uh, we have so many strings available. So we do testing all the time. This data that you see here is collected from our uh, from the testing in our company. Uh, the red line is uh, the is, is power from a string that is connected to the QB, and blue line is from a string that is not connected to QB, but they're exactly the same. Uh, otherwise, besides being, I mean, uh, besides the uh, besides connection to QB, the strings are exactly the same. You can see the power change, the, the difference in power between the two strings uh, because of the inclusion of the QB. Uh, the, the kinks on the blue line on the right-hand side is because of a mechanism that is outside the scope of uh, this webinar. But uh, if you send us a, uh, if, you, if you send us a question directly, we will be able to answer the question later. Now, um, in this slide, uh, we've done a simulation of the solar uh, solar cells. This is a solar cell simulation. Uh, as you can see, if the additional carriers, we have uh, additional additional six, uh, 10 to the 16 uh, uh, carriers or electrons per square centimeter, the efficiency increase could be as high as 55. Or the efficiency could be as high as 55 percent. Oh, I'm sorry. Is 55 milliamp per square centimeter current. In the normal uh, in the normal case, you don't exceed more than 39 or 30, 36 square uh, uh, milliamp per square centimeter. So there is so much of increase possible um, if additional carriers were available. Now uh, <coughs> let's look at the, the uh, net effect of inclusion of this technology. The first of all, the Im uh, impact is reduction of cost on the, on the balance of system side. In order to maintain the minimum power requirement while the array performance declines every year, the EPCs oversize the array with the BOS component by 5% or 10%. With UST, the power can be increased by 50 to 20% from the beginning and even after the degradation over time, the panels would be performing better uh, than the baseline. With USD, it can be done at much lower cost. And uh, there is, there will be a dramatic increase in, uh, the dramatic decrease in the, in the cost per watt. We have some numbers who will probably be uh, presenting to you later with the, um, in this slide, as you can see, the system cost is lowered by additional uh, additional materials needed to oversize through the equipment needed to uh, to be maintained. As a result, improve, improving the whole value chain of solar insulation. So this slide is talking about existing insulation. In the previous slide, we talked about new insulation. Let's talk about the existing insulation. So as you know, um, <coughs> this severe degradation in solar power from, uh, from year to year, year, year over year. Uh, in the first year, you see very high amount of degradation. Next few years, it is, it is, it is lower. But in about 10 years or so, you, you see a good 7-8% uh, mm, degradation. So. If there is a solar installation that has uh, that has module degradation, then that is faster than predicted, or is already below the PPA rating, quantum boost will increase the output of those modules from wherever they they are today by 20%. So it is a valuable asset to add to the system even after 10 years of production in a in a solar system, depending upon the output of panels in production. So as you can see, we can add the power from wherever it is by 20 percent. Yeah, the the uh, solar market in this, in this 
like we're talking about uh, the U.S. solar market, and is driven by two things, as you can see, compliance market, a voluntary market. But the end result is that um, uh, the our product can be used in both the markets. We are well positioned for the <coughs> new and aftermarket volumes, and it's not only available in the U.S., but it will be available globally. So in the next slide, we are talking about market position. The product today is designed for string inverters. The, the distributed power generation markets in light commercial and residential are the natural fish today. There's nothing in the technology that, prevent Q, that prevents QB being higher power and able to handle strings of 2400 or 3600 other than resources to, to do the engineering. There is a 600 volts product on the roadmap that will open the window towards 1000 volt system later on. It is an enabling technology that can be licensed and designed into other products to deliver the same value at potentially lower cost. So today, the quantum boost is, is a value product. To add 20% more production in a standard way, increasing the number of panels, racking, wiring, and labor, the increase in cost is greater than 15%. To add quantum boost to the system to increase by 20% more production, the comparative cost would be 5% or even lower. So it is, so it's an immediate 3x three, three or more improvement on the cost. You, of course, would have to model it first to make sure you, uh, you maintain your level of performance. We talk about competitive landscape in the next slide. There is no direct competition right now. There is no other company that can increase the power of the solar cell. Most of the, most of the, uh, most of the technologies that are available, they, they do optimizing of the power in the stream. So, <coughs> but we, if we have to think about who the competitors are, we can look at some indirect com uh, competition. So, um, let's look at DC to DC power, it only recovers lost power. So, you know, as I said, we have no, no direct competitors right now. There are no other pyroelectric products that do what we do in the market, or there, there, there's no other product that is uh, uh, that does what we do in the market. The production is not, this product is not a string optimizer. It is not dependent upon mm, bright sunlight only, and it has characteristics that go beyond just increasing the power coming out of the solar panel. As I mentioned earlier, there are technologies coming that, uh, technologies coming that will, uh, that will use the same principles um, you see, uh, you've been introduced to today, but it'll be, <coughs> It'll be a lot more costly, and it'll take a lot more time before it uh, before uh, before you before you see it. So, the summary. In summary, quantum boost can lower the, the overall balance of the system in an, uh, balances and costs essentially in an installation, recover the value in an existing system. It is a true disruptive technology. A tier one innovation coming to the uh, renewable space that will increase product, uh, production and lower o &M costs over time. We welcome you. Um, we welcome you all to our announcement at SPI in October. Um, we understand this new revolutionary technology has generated a lot of questions. We wanted to give extra time to allow the audience to ask questions to enhance their technical understanding of the product and continue on with their uh, questions. So over to questions now. Thanks, Antosh. Uh, we really appreciated your presentation on, that, on your brand new technology. Um, and you are correct. We will now open this up for questions. Um, there are, of course, several different markets um, in terms of panel production, where do you see ultrasolar technology being most effective in terms of the power boost that you can give to um, panels? Well, essentially, it, 
applies everywhere. So um, right now we have we're focusing on crystallines. Uh, well, crystalline in the bottom and uh, poly polycrystalline silicon. Um, so that's where it is most ap applicable right now. But we have tried this technology on um, on uh, six, for instance, and cadmium telluride. But uh, mm, that's not our focus right now for obvious reason that most of the market is uh, crystalline silicon and uh, uh, polycrystalline silicon. Here's another question. Uh, what does pyroelectricity have to do with applying an AC field to conventional solar modules? And how on earth could that work out in energy balance? Uh, the question also is that with current solar cells, there's hardly a way to increase current by reducing recombination or increasing electron mobility by an amount that makes sense economically. The bulk is not limiting solar cell efficiency in monocrystalline cells, it's only the surfaces. Good question. So let me answer, let me divide this question in two parts. First question was related to pyroelectricity, and second was related to uh, there is not enough electrons available um, to, uh, to generate more power. So the, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, the technology is, is based on applying high power pulses, high, high frequency pulses uh, to, be, to, the, to the solar cell. And as I um, showed to you, the high frequency or high power pulses help to, to capture the heart carriers, the electrons that would otherwise be lost, or uh, they are lost. So uh, the, the, the obvious question is, hey, if you really need high frequency pulses, why wouldn't you use the standard electronics to generate high frequency pulses? Uh, the answer is that uh, you could do that, but you'll be losing a lot more power than uh, that you'll be producing. And in fact, in our experience and the experience of uh, some of our partners, the if you in order to generate half the frequency or one tenth of the frequency, you burn most of the components. So it's not it's very difficult. Um, Spiroelectricity, in, in uh, on the other hand, is uh, if the structure is right, you can generate high frequency pulses without a lot of problems. So that's the reason we use pyroelectricity. The second question was, are there enough electrons available to, uh, to harvest that much of uh, energy? The answer is yes. Uh, there are a lot of publications, if you, uh, if, you especially, if you especially look at the publications about heart carriers, there are uh, easily, there are publications which says 10 to the 17 uh, uh, carriers per square centimeter are, uh, you, you can generate uh, by by capturing hot carrier, we're not even talking about that. If you if you if you could actually um, capture 10 to the 17 carriers, your uh, current per square centimeter would be 65, which is double of what it is right now. Uh, but if you if you're able to capture you know 10 percent of the hot carriers or 20 percent, 15 percent of the hot carriers, you 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 can very easily increase the uh, increase the power by 20 percent or so. So the, where do where do these carriers come from? These carriers come from the uh, from the higher energy solar wavelengths, which generate electrons which are either which either lose their energy or the electrons are lost altogether by giving up their energy to the uh, to the lattice and generating phonons. All right, this question from Chris: uh, Does this work cost effectively with strings of microinverters, and how does it fit into that scenario? Good question. Um, we haven't actually used it with strings of microinverters. We've used one micro microinverter, as we showed you in the picture. Uh, so so far, we have used it with uh, with string inverters. Uh, would it you? Uh, unless we uh, we'll we'll do some experiments and find out whether it works whether it works with microinverter or not. It's it's not the technology. It's the interference by the microinverters that I suspect could cause, could cause problems. My very limited experience taught me that modulating anything at more than hundreds of megahertz is extremely difficult and requires tailored hardware design. If I understand what you were talking about correctly, that means that modulating panels with significant capacitance and impedance is something that ultrasolar will have to handle. I'm, I hope I'm missing something there. So, well, this is, this is a great question again. Uh, the 
yeah, the answer is yes. If you were using circuitry, external circuitry to, to create this uh, create this frequency, you will not be able to create it. That's period. It will be very hard. I mean, uh, we've tried to do this. I mean, uh, forget the capacitance and all that. You will burn all the components. Um, so, uh, so obviously, we do not use. That's that's the reason we do not use external components or external circuitry to to generate hard carrier. It is possible, but uh, I mean, so to generate high frequency, it is possible, but you need specialized components, and the system cost will become very, very high. <coughs> and, uh, with the uh, we using we using pyroelectric coating in the glass, and that uh, by modulating that with the with the power from the solar cell, we can easily create the frequency that we that we require. So uh, as we sh as I showed in the presentation, we can create uh, theoretically we can create several hundred gigahertz. Uh, using in using an etalon structure, but uh, right now we're able to create something in the neighborhood of the gigahertz or uh, a couple of a couple of gigahertz, a few gigahertz from time, and that is good enough for us. So, to, to uh, the short answer to your question is, we do not use external circuitry to uh, uh, to, to to create high frequency pulses, and that's why we're using pyroelectric. So this question from Andy, uh, will it reduce the life of the solar panels and what is the highest temperature at which it can operate? Well, that's that's a great question. Again, we are working on reliability, so that's a very appropriate question uh, at this stage. Uh, we, uh, from our limited testing, reliability testing, we have gone, we gone to 500 hours without any problem, uh, without any degradation in the, in the um, uh, solar um, um, in, in, the, in the efficiency of the solar cells. Uh, let me also mention to you that because the way this technology works, it might actually solve a uh, reliability problem of the solar panels, which is PID, because it includes the uh, PID is generated because of the charge that's accumulated in the solar panel, and we are using opposite charges uh, in an indirect way. So uh, in our experience, we've actually reduced uh, if not solve altogether uh, PID problems on our panels. Uh, so, uh, short question again. I mean, short answer again. Uh, we do not see any reliability uh, issues, any any degradation, and that is probably because we we know how much power, how much voltage do we need to uh, what, uh, how much voltage do we need to have in the in the pulses in order to uh, um, in order not to degrade the solar panels. So Jim Piero asks, uh, can this be used with an impedance optimizer product? Impedance optimizer, impedance optimizer. We, um, it, yeah, it, it, it should be able to use. I mean, we, we haven't used it, but I don't see any reason why it should be, why we shouldn't be able to use with the impedance optimizers. Will this work with the solar edge optimizer inverter system Clark wants to know? Um, solar edge optimizers. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> I mean, my our obvious question is why would you use uh, solar edge uh, along with this? But I don't see a reason why it wouldn't work because this because this effect is independent of um, all the other what what all the other optimizers are trying to do. So I would say yes, but you know, I have to admit we haven't done that, so we do, we don't have we don't have first hand experience with that. If this, if your product was used on an old plant, would you need to verify um, if they need to change the inverter, and how about the current and voltage increases? Um, good question. We do not increase the voltage, or we don't do not change the voltage dramatically. So most, uh, in most of the cases, we've been able to use the same. Actually, in all the cases, we've been able to use the same inverter. Uh, we work with uh, SMA, we work with Keiko, we work with Power One, we work with, uh, I mean, even some Japanese inverters. So <coughs> we we have not had to change anything to the inverter, and primarily because it's the voltage that limits it. And um, the well, we, of course, increase current, and, uh, and most of the inverters are able to handle a lot more current than, uh, than, than they're being used for. 
So, Figure two shows some of the supposed pulses that are applied to the solar cell. And um, I noted that the pulses with 100 nanoseconds and a frequency of 10 megahertz correspond to a steady signal. This seems to be an oversight from making up the numbers. Can you address that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, first of all, um, uh, 10 megahertz is not a steady signal. Um, you can see 10 megahertz quite, quite easily on any, uh, on, on, your, on any oscilloscope. And uh, we have shown 10 megahertz. We did not show the real, we did not want to reveal the real, uh, um, you know, real signals in, in, a, in a publication like this. But uh, our signals are actually a lot higher frequency but than, what's, than, what it, than, what, than what was uh, shown in the, uh, um, in, in the paper. Uh, the, so the question is that it's not steady, I mean the answer is that it's not a steady signal. It is, uh, mm, it's a high frequency signal, you can easily see high frequency. It's, it's quite easy, it's, it's, well it's not too difficult to see high frequency, high frequency pulses and uh, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, by steady, I, I'm, I'm assuming the uh, uh, the question is whether it is like DC or not. So the answer is not. It's not DC. It's, uh, I mean, high frequency is high frequency. In fact, some you know, um, there are there are specialized fields where people use terahertz signals. Where people try to use terahertz signals. I mean, then uh, if according to this logic, that would be all DC, and nothing would work with DC. So the the, the answer is it's not DC. Yeah, it's it's not it's not steady signal. Uh, in fact, we create a, speci a specific pattern of the signal, so it's not even steady signal. It's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a particular pattern that we need in order to uh, make this technology work. For a hundred kilowatt installation, Andy wants to know: with eight string inverters, what would be the approximate cost of adding your device, and what would be the improvement in production? So, um, <coughs> let me go back to one of the slides I have. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I have a, I prepared an answer <laughs> for this question. Let me let me read it. So as I mentioned, the presentation cube is a value product. The value is in the cost uh, cost saving and uh, the increase of uh, power harvested. It will be slightly different for each application. Our research has shown us that at cost level projected in 2016, where we are by basing our prices on, um, we deliver back. 3x to 5x value based upon residential installation at $2.20 per watt and, and utility scale at $1.80 per watt. Our pricing model will be based on will be based on sharing that value component with the system, insta system installer or EPC or owner with less than 50% of, um, of that value um, staying with our solar. Larry wants to know what is the consumption related to quantum boost for each module uh, of PV installed, and he want to also wants to know did you evaluate the effect of this new technology versus the Europe Electric Regulation, and could it be applied to an Italian PV plant? Um, so let me first address the consumption question. PV is not externally powered. I mean, the QB is not externally powered. It is powered by the solar cell itself, so there is no consumption externally. And uh, as far as the Italian, uh, yeah, so we we are we're not very familiar with that. But I mean, I I can tell you this: we have done the one of the fears that people have is uh, with a high frequency, would it be uh, would would it be failing um, EMI testing or something like that? So in order to address that question, we've done EMI testing and we passed the EMI testing. Uh, primarily because our pulses are consumed by the solar cell, they're not, you know, you don't have any, any, uh, um, any spare signals available. Now, uh, as far as the European um, market is concerned, Italian market is concerned, um, we, we haven't done the testing, or we need to actually look at the specifics of the European market to understand that. Uh, Sean wants to know, can we use this device with 24 or 48 volt inverters, or can it only work with string inverters? So theoretically, it will work for 24 to, uh, to 48. So the technology, um, let me divide this in two parts. One is the technology. The, the technology will work with anything. So we have, to answer the question, we have worked with 24 or 48 uh, volt, inverter, uh, volt inverters as well. But uh, mm, 
the market was for larger inverters or larger larger string size. That's why we moved to that. Uh, the answer is yes, it will work with 2448 volt inverter as well. Uh, how does this, uh, Nandu wants to know, how does this affect the NOCT of cells and modules? Um, NOCT. Hmm. That is, um, so it should not, it should not make any impact to that, but uh, we'll have to look at the specific to understand that. But uh, from the high level, I can think, um, I don't think it should make any, it should, it should impact that. Uh, Michael wants to know, will this work with SIGs, um, i.e. cylinder systems with the AE260 kilowatt inverters? Well, so it has worked with SIGs quite well. Um, in fact, in the past, we were working with some SIGs manufacturers. Uh, so, yeah, the, it, it worked with SIGs. In fact, it worked with SIGs quite well. Um, we don't know about, uh, we haven't worked with Colindra cells, so we do, know about, do not know about Colindra, but we work with other uh, SIGs manufacturers. Should, should, not, should not be a problem. Yeah, we have uh, five days of continuous testing data from SIGs. It, Mike, Michael had a follow-up, too, um, that you probably are best to take offline um, about getting a test system to install uh, for those for the SIGs he was talking about. Um, Jeff says, will this technology be applicable to silicon solar cells under concentrated energy? Uh -huh. um, we haven't tried, it with, tried this with concentrated technology. Uh, so if I mean, theoretically, it should be working, but uh, we haven't tried this technology with concentrated either silicon or, ga you know, or gallium arsenide or other other uh, mm, cells. So at this stage, it'll be hard to say unless we unless we test it properly. Theoretically, it should be working, but uh, um, we don't have any experimental data. Ed says, and, uh, "Oh, go ahead. Sorry." So I want, I want to mention to uh, all the people who are asking questions that they can also contact us directly and we can we can answer their questions about about their specific systems. Um, Ed asks, I don't understand what you're saying about capturing hot carriers as if they are not already captured in ordinary cells. Don't most carriers start out as hot carriers, thermalized to the conduction band edge, and then are captured? So that's a good question. Um, there are two mechanisms. One is capturing the hard carriers uh, when they're thermalized. So when the hard carriers are captured, they're too, uh, you could either lose all the energy, uh, the hard carrier could lose all the energy and stay in the, uh, in, in, you know, so still stay in the conduction band. Those electrons will be count, countered towards the, uh, um, towards the total current. However, in a lot of cases, uh, these electrons are lost altogether, and they just generate phonons. And we have experimental proof of that. We, uh, in fact, you can you can dramatically lose the electrons. Um, and uh, in those cases, you we do get extra electrons uh, uh, from from hot carriers. Uh, is 20 percent? Uh, David wants to know a minimum expectation for small residential systems. Uh, he believes that anything under that would not be easily measured at the homes. So 20% is yes. We we get more than 20% uh, all the time. And if it is if it if the system is properly optimized, if, if our box is properly optimized for the system, there's some optimization required from case from case to case. But if it's properly optimized, uh, you can get more than 20%. Uh, the uh, the current produced? Is it sine wave or square wave? The current produces sine wave or square wave. The current that comes out is DC. Okay. Um, um, no, yeah, it's the inverter that converts it. So. Ed wants to know, do the bypass diodes have to be removed for QB to work? Um, or do they, don't they interfere with the volt, voltage pulses? No, they don't. Uh, so bypass uh, diodes do not have to be re uh, do not have to be removed, and one of the reasons is that the frequency that we're talking about is much higher for the diode for the uh, uh, for the bypass diodes to, to, to react to. So <coughs> no, they don't have to be removed. 
Amy asks, you mentioned that it boosts uh, the current, and he wants to know by how, by what percentage and in an existing installation would that require changing the breaker? Well, from our experience, we haven't had to change the breaker <laughs> even once. Um, that is a 20 percent boost. I, well, we, so in our experience, we don't we did not have to change the uh, breaker even once. <coughs> So, All right. This will, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. most of the most of the breakers are rated, um, you know, are um, are rated for higher currents than the, than the use for anyway. So, yeah, the answer is we we, we don't have any experience having to, having to change breakers. Um, and this is the last question coming from Harb. Will this technology work with existing AEI 333 kilowatt bipolar inverter systems? Well, <laughs> yeah, I would suggest that um, the uh, we, uh, let uh, let the uh, person who's sending the who, who's who's asking the question send the question to us directly because we'll have to understand, we'll have to study the AI inverter. Uh, we do not know much about that inverter yet, so. and we'll have to look at the system specifications actually. Perfect. Well, thanks for, for taking your time to answer all these, those questions, Santosh. Um, if you have additional questions uh, for Santosh, you can send your questions to me at uh, fandorka at solarpowerworldonline.com, um, and I will pass them along to him. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar from Solar Power World and Ultra Solar Technology. Uh, please look for this presentation in your inbox because we will email it to you tomorrow. And it will also be available at www.solarpowerworld.com. Thank you very much.